Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event, Trick or Treat, the Lowdown on Criminal Justice Reform, co-sponsored by <coughs> co-sponsored by the University of California Press and the New Press. My name is Jay, and I'll be running tech for tonight. A couple of housekeeping points. ASL interpreting, interpretation and captioning are available. I want to thank our interpreters and our live captioner, Emily, for making this event accessible. To enable captions, click the CC button on the bottom of your screen, and to pose a question to the panelists, use the Q&A button. Now just for some bios of our um, panelists. Maya Shenoir is Editor-in-Chief of Truthout. She is the co-author with Victoria Law, A Prison by Any Other Name, and the author of Lockdown, Locked Out. She is the co-editor of Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? Police Violence and Resistance in the United States. Victoria Law is a freelance journalist focused on issues of incarceration. She is Maya's co-author of Prison by Any Other Name. Her other books are Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women, and Prisons Keep Us Safer, and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration. Kay Whitlock is a writer slash activist focusing on structural violence and inequality. She is the co-author of Queer Injustice, the criminalization of LGBT people in the United States, as well as Considering Hate, Violence, Goodness, and Justice in American Culture and Politics, as well as Carceral Khan. <clears throat> Nancy A. Heitzig is Professor of Sociology at St. Catherine University, whose work centers on race, class, gender, and social control with particular attention to the prison industrial complex. She is the author of The School to Prison Pipeline, Education, Discipline, and Racialized Double Standards, and along with Kay Whitlock, is co-author of Carceral Khan. And our moderator, Andrea J. Ritchie, is a black lesbian immigrant police misconduct attorney and organizer whose writing, litigation, and advocacy has focused on policing and criminalization of women and LGBT people of color for the past two decades. She is currently researcher in residence on race, gender, sexuality, and criminalization at the Barnard Center for Research on Women, where she recently launched the Interrupting Criminalization Research and Action Initiative. She is the author of Invisible No More, Police Violence Against Black Women and Women of Color. And without further ado, uh, let's start tonight's event. I'll pass the mic off to Maya and Vicky for a brief land acknowledgement. Thank you, Jay. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Tonight, the authors and moderator are on lands that are the territory of indigenous tribes and nations, including in New York City, the Lenape, in Minneapolis, the Dakota, in Chicago, the Council of the Three Fires, the Odawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi nations, and in Missoula, Montana, the Kootenai, the Salish, and the Pendore. We note with sorrow and anger the violent history of settler colonial conquest in the lands now collectively referred to as the United States. And colonial claim not only to land, but to water, all living things, and the very air we breathe. That history of genocide and dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations is ongoing and contested. This reality exists in interrelationship with violence against and erasure of so many peoples here as the result of the forces of slavery, imperialism, continuous war, policing, and environmental catastrophe. Tonight, these histories are also present in the virtual space we have entered together. They inform everything in our conversation, work, and lives. We must never forget these realities not only to acknowledge and mourn that violence, death, and erasure, but also to strengthen our collective determination to create a different world. Tonight, we are going to be using framing the conversation generally around these major overarching points. Over the past 20 years, a bipartisan reform consensus has emerged and is being institutionalized. It consists 
of philanthropy-driven brokered agreements by elite public and private interests across a libertarian, right, centrist, liberal, liberal political spectrum. These unlikely allies agreements create and expand a self-serving, self-perpetuating reform industry. Can we change again? Yeah. These reforms appear responsive to growing public opposition to systemic police violence, mass incarceration, and surveillance. But the treats promised more public safety, an end to overcriminalization, and taxpayer savings are a con. Instead, we get trickery quote unquote, reformist reforms that expand policing and systems of carceral control and surveillance. Once in place, these are not easily changed. We must analyze reforms within the context of racial capitalism and the structural racial, class, gender, and ableist inequality and violence that it requires. Dismantling the profound harms of structural violence and inequality calls us to reject reformist reforms. It calls us to chart new way forward. Fortunately, that work is already well underway. And with that, we will kick off our conversation I'm Andrea, I'm your moderator for this evening. I'm gonna invite the panelists when they come on camera again to start into this conversation to describe themselves for folks who can't see. So I am a very light-skinned black woman with curly hair and glasses and some mother of pearl earrings, a uh, black cape, and I'm sitting in front of um, a piece of brown mud cloth in my apartment. Um, and I am uh, the moderator for tonight's conversation. I'm so grateful um, to be in this conversation. Both of these books, um, Carceral Con and Prison by Any Other Name, Carceral Con, Prison by Any Other Name, um, are recently out in paperback, um, are just both incredibly timely for this moment. Um, as what Mariam Kaba, my colleague at Interrupting Criminalization, calls police preservationists are running the carceral con and pushing prison by every other name or any other name across the country at every single level from federal, state, county, and local in response to the very real threat to the legitimacy of policing and the larger prison industrial complex posed by the 2020 uprisings and ongoing campaigns to defund police, close jails and stop jail expansion and to decarcerate prison and immigration detention populations during and beyond the pandemic. So let's just start there. You gave us a little teaser um, with the intro framing, but Kay and Nancy, just break it down for us. What is the carceral con? Who's running it and why? And describe yourself uh, as you uh, introduce yourself. Right. Uh, I'm Kay Whitlock. I am a 72 year old white woman with um, hair that is completely white, silver, gray. I'm probably more Montana than a uh, big urban city. I wear glasses and I'm sitting in uh, a little study uh, in my office. It's just surrounded by books. So Andrea, the con is that so many people really sincerely hope and want to believe that the bipartisan criminal legal system reforms that are on offer now are going to improve policing and police violence, create more public safety and end or at least severely reduce systemic racism. They want and hope that it will dismantle mass incarceration and free up more public revenues so that that's available for social needs. But the con, of course, is that bipartisan reform agendas or expand rather than permanently shrink systems of policing, surveillance, and carceral control. The agendas pour more resources, both public and private, into that system, into widening nets of criminalization, policing, 
and surveillance. They speak not of racial justice, but of racial disparities and adjusting those within the system as if it's just the diversity mix in the system and not the violent, racist, classist, gendered, ableist catastrophe of the system itself that's the problem. So who's running the con? Primarily a philanthropy-driven set of elite public and private interests who have agreed on certain reform templates and join together in promoting and acting, implementing and evaluating them. So in a time of widening and deepening social and economic precarity in US society as a whole, it's really clear that the most significant though unstated impacts are to shore up the legitimacy of policing and carceral systems, to stay ahead of and blunt mounting growing uprisings and protests against mm -hmm. uh, carceral violence. And that is to say, if you sum it up, the main impact is to reinforce the stability and the authority of these systems across federal, state, and local administrations, no matter who's in power. Nancy? Yes. Did you wanna? Yeah, I'll pick up on that. Um, I'm Nancy. I'm a white woman, long auburn hair, um, big black readers that I may take on and off. Um, it's possible a cat might zoom bomb this event. And I'm sitting in front of my uh, favorite Andy Warhol print of uh, the many uh, multicolored faces of Chairman Mao. Um, one of the, one of the things to probably talk about here is carceral um, and what that means. A um, lot of discussion about the carceral state, this overarching, really complete political economy um, that is deeply, well, number one, rooted in racial capitalism and, uh, you know, and, and number two, um, incredibly extensive um, to the extent that it's a prison industrial complex that, well, has overtaken so much of, um, you know, our lives. Um, the United States is the number one incarcerator in the world. We have 2.3 people, million people in prison and jail, another 7 million under some kind of correctional control. We have one in four with a criminal record, which continues to have long lasting collateral consequences and ripple effects throughout um, people's lifetimes. And, and of course, an incredible, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars expended on this vast apparatus of criminalization, policing, surveillance and incarceration. So yes, it's a con um, and, and, and yes, it's a big one. Absolutely, and I appreciate you really breaking down the use of the term carceral because I think it's getting thrown a lot these around a lot these days, and, and mm -hmm. people aren't being super specific about it. So I appreciate you really connecting that. There's so much in what you both just said. I'm going to come back to you both, both around this question of bipartisan consensus and the role of philanthropy. But I just want to check in with Maya and Vicky in terms of you know your books, uh, Prison by Another Name, talks about some of the things that we don't sometimes think about as carceral. Um, so alternate mechanisms of surveillance, containment and control, what role do those mechanisms play in the larger carceral con that we're outlining here? Sure, I can start. Um, so I'm Vicki, I am an Asian woman. I have, I have black hair. I'm sitting in front of a red wall with some prison art and some books. I am wearing a brown shirt with beads and long dangly silver earrings. I think that's it. Um, so you asked about how these alternates play into the carceral con and, oh, and sometimes I have $3 glasses that are purple that I take on and off. Um, and if I'm squinting at you, it just means that uh, I probably need to take my glasses on or off. Um, so these alternates play into the carceral con because they appear to be mechanisms 
that reduce the numbers of people in the brick and mortar jails and prisons. And what they do in reality is they expand that logic of prison and punitive control outside of these brick and mortar buildings into our homes via electronic monitoring, via, um, you know, via probation, um, via curfews into our communities through mechanisms such as predictive policing um, and into our other institutions, such as institutions that are supposed to provide care of some sort or another. And so what we have instead is a widening of the net and a normalizing of this kind of surveillance and punishment. Um, and it allows the state to put more people under some sort of coercive control, whether it is inside jails or prisons, or whether it is on monitoring, or whether it is under some sort of police surveillance or um, expanded policing. And it doesn't necessarily reduce the numbers of people who are locked away in cages. A key point is during the um, first months of the coronavirus pandemic of 2020 in Chicago, which had huge outbreaks in its Cook County Jail, um, the numbers of people being released from the brick and mortar jails onto home um, electronic monitoring for their pre-trial confinement jumped from 2,417 to over 3,300. And they were the largest pre-trial electronic monitoring population for any jail in the United States. And people might think, well, what's so bad about taking them out of jail where they cannot social distance, they don't have access to masks, they don't have access to soap, they're more likely to get COVID. And when COVID comes in, it's just going to go bananas. But what ended up happening was that even though the pandemic was not over, some months later, police started arresting and judges started sending people back to the jail and jail populations began rising. And at the same time, the numbers of people being sent sentenced to be on or being put on electronic monitoring before their day in court continued to rise. So now we just had rising populations of people in jail and then electronic jail. We didn't have large numbers of people being freed. We didn't have large numbers of people not being arrested, not being punished, not being confined for, um, for, for criminalized actions. Instead, we just had an expansion of these actions. And so this is the problem with these alternate mechanisms. And it plays into the con game of looking at this idea that we are doing something about mass incarceration when really what we're doing is we're just shuffling it around into other forms. Thanks so much. Go ahead, uh, Maya. Yeah, absolutely, Vicki. Um, so I'll say I'm Maya, I'm a white, woman with long dark brown hair. I have green eyes and I'm wearing a, a greenish bluish long sleeve sweater. And in my background, there's, I have the, the least interesting background. There's a white wall and two doors. Um, wonder what's behind them. And uh, there's a little green spider plant and both of our books sitting right there. So yeah, as, as Vicki said, our book discusses a whole lot of these mechanisms that don't actually provide alternatives to prison, but provide the illusion of alternatives to prison and policing. While really what they're doing is expanding the web of carceral control of social and economic control of people's lives. And I think it's worth noting that a lot of these like drug courts and sex worker rescue programs and mandatory psychiatric treatment are things that have not only been praised by kind of like conservatives and mainstream politicians, but also by a lot of progressives as replacements for incarceration. So, oh, it's, you know, we need to build up these programs. We need to fund these programs so that we can put people here instead of prison. But of course, like all of these other systems that, that we've been talking about thus far, they've actually become add-ons. So drug courts, people are being funneled in there who 
might have otherwise had their charges dropped or been offered voluntary treatment or put on a less restrictive probation, something like that. We, so we see this happening in all these different realms. And I also, I also want to point out that some of these so-called alternate mechanisms are just rebranding the exact same thing. So community police are police. We talk in our book about how community policing is this buzzword and it's often lifted up as the solution to police violence. Even when we see actually a lot of the police officers who've been the, the perpetrators in highly publicized shootings were hired on community policing grants. But still, it's like community policing is the solution that's lifted up. Joe Biden just declared the first, um, the first full week in October, National Community Policing Week. And he's putting this forth, not only as a response to the, the so-called crime wave, but also in response to police violence, to, to people being more aware of the violence of policing and the racism of policing. His solution, still community policing. But what it means is adding more police, more money for police, with the rationale that the police need to be in the community, mingling and building trust. Um, but of course, what, what happens in practice is community policing is flooding predominantly Black communities, communities of color, with more and more police who can harass and surveil and arrest and kill people. So some of the con is a rebranding project for, for the same old types of violence. Definitely. And in Chicago, there's where you and are, Maya, there's like a couple of really clear examples. One was Rakia Boyd was killed by an officer who, you know, sometimes we think, oh, if cops just live in the neighborhood where people are, they'll understand better. And instead, it just gave him more opportunity to get annoyed when a group of young people were hanging on a corner, as young people do, and kill one of them um, in response. And then um, north of Chicago, uh, Wyatt Senek actually did a whole, um, in his Problem Areas series on HBO, a whole thing on Elgin's community policing program where they shot the Cynthia Clements in spite of being trumpeted as like the community policing program in the nation. So those are just two examples I can think of where you are. Um, there's so many across the country that show that con playing out. Yeah, and actually someone we interviewed for our book said that I can't remember the exact wording, but he said that community policing just meant you recognize the person who is beating you and, and brutalizing and abusing you. And they know you really well too, right? <laughs> so you, you mentioned um, uh, Biden and you mentioned that, you know, it's not just regrets like right-wing folks who are advancing this con, that it's also people on the liberal progressive end of the spectrum. So I wanted to come back to UK and, and Nancy around, I feel like one of the really unique contributions of your book is this critique of the bipartisan consensus approach to criminal punishment issues. And, you know, I was trying to remember when I was reading it, like, when did this first start? Because there's so many instances I can think of over the past 20 years where like the conventional wisdom in circles of folks who are trying to reduce the harm of the criminal punishment system was that nothing's gonna happen unless you can get agreement across both sides of the aisle. And the goal is to get someone like Orrin Hatch or Pat Robertson or Rand Paul, these sort of progressive quote unquote Republicans to sign whatever you're trying to get done. And I also remember like the moment where suddenly the Koch brothers, which I had to Google and be like, who are these guys? Were in all these meetings. I was like, oh, these are uber capitalists. How are they in these meetings? And why is it being sold to us that these are the folks we have to have at the table in order to move anything. So can you say more about how this bipartisan consensus part of the con came about? I guess Kay or Nancy? You know, I'll let Kay speak more to um, um, the more um, recent, you know, past 20 years configuration of it. Um, you know, but if we trace our um, sort of current situation of hyper, incarceration back to late 60s 
early 70s. You know, 1970, we had 200,000 people in prison and jail. And of course, that's exploded. Um, you know, the, the efforts even then um, were bipartisan. Um, so there's always been um, some agreement um, across party lines on uh, you know the need for law and order, um, bipartisan agreement on the war on drugs, um, the war on crime, um, sentencing reform, the you know the emergence of pretty dracon draconian mandatory minimum sentences, um, the rise of the supermax. You know, of course, the biggest expansion in the system happens during the the Clinton '90s, and you know Joe Biden is certainly a major player in that. So, um, you know, a bipartisan element um, in all of this from the beginning, but but certainly um, a coalition and um, entrenchment really of that currently. Kay? Yeah, I will, you know, we've been tracing um, the development of, of what we call the, the, the current bipartisan reform consensus uh, for quite a few years. And what's new this time around in the bipartisanship circle is that over the past 20 years, we've seen the emergence of an incredibly well-coordinated strategic effort to put together a system of public-private partnerships to shape, promote, implement, administer and evaluate reforms throughout the criminal legal system, where we used to see sort of series of reforms that would focus on sentencing, or we'd see something that dealt for better, or for worse, often for worse with rehabilitation or with the building of supermax prisons. This time, there's almost no arena in the criminal legal system that's left untouched by this sort of coordinated approach. And that means this new bipartisan consensus has been formed to fund, coordinate, build, and institutionalize not only a series of policy reforms, but the means to carry them forward, which is to say to build a self-reinforcing, self-perpetuating, closed system that Nancy and I, among ourselves, call Reform Incorporated. And we've seen, um, as, as Vicki and Mai have been talking, uh, the reforms going way beyond the bricks and mortar uh, systems to, to create digital prisons and the creation of new surveillance technologies and tools. It was in the early 2000s, we can trace it back at least to 2003, but certainly by 2007, we begin to see this concerted forward movement toward bringing state and local governments, the federal governments together with big foundations, big donors and think tanks to develop reform temp uh, templates in a whole um, variety of areas. And we see the development of rhetorical frameworks. We're going to save taxpayer dollars. We're going to create more public safety. We're going to uh, reduce overcriminalization. Uh, we're going to take these magnificent savings uh, and reinvest them in justice strategies. So I talked years ago with one very highly placed foundation official at one of the really big foundations who's a part of this who wished to remain off the record. And he told me quite frankly, that coming into these discussions that were, were sort of convened by a, a circle of, 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 of big foundations and funders and mega nonprofit organizations, that the right was far more prepared to deal with the framing and reform templates as centrist, moderates and liberals. And the, not that the liberals were even, you know, the liberals are coming in with incredibly good intentions, right? And some decent justice work, but they were not as a group or even as individual organizations prepared or even necessarily willing to go to the mat on issues related to structural racism and poverty that produce 
these problems, not that are just in the criminal legal system, criminal punishment system, but that literally created this. So one glue um, used to bring diverse players together across the political spectrum, of course, uh, was money. And I'm talking tons and tons of money. I'm talking certainly well over a hundred million that we can document, but I'm guessing uh, way, way more than that. And that supports coalitions, organizations, it supports existing organizations, and it creates entirely new ones, some of which masquerade as grassroots organizations, some of which look to be quasi official uh, councils that are willing to work and must work in quote, unlikely allies configurations, especially fusing the right with centrists and liberals. And that is literally a requirement. You know, years ago, I began talking a, a lot of years ago, I was talking with friends and um, colleagues in organizations and um, smaller funding circles and so forth that talked about the very real pressures they were under. You talked about being aware of this. Uh, Andrea, and they were told this was the only way to have major lasting impact, that you had to ally basically with the right. That's who they were talking to. So one glue is money. Another glue is the requirement that um, liberals and even progressives work together with the right and with all of the limitations that the right uh, imposes on that. So we have hundreds of millions of dollars going for various campaigns, contracts, grants, consulting fees, research projects, publications, conferences, social impact investments, and the creation of new reform coalitions and organizations that are now permanent, often expanding features in the reform world, sort of choreographing and um, determining the shape and scope of reform. Some of this money is public from the federal or state governments. Much of it is private from billionaires and large foundations to wealthy private donors and even to private investors. So um, that's it. There's a lot of money. And you know, I'll just reiterate the point earlier on that what the impact of this is, is to expand and build a criminal legal system that will last into future decades, ensuring stability across administrations and public without ever tinkering with structural racism, structural poverty, structural gender violence, structural ableism, and structural anti-immigrant violence. So helpful, Kay, to sort of frame it in that big way, because I think we see some of the players and the pieces of it, but we don't ever see kind of the whole infrastructure. And when you were saying $100 million, I was like, for folks who want to preserve the current system as it is, that's a pretty, that's actually a small investment for what you're saying, a lasting impact of preserving something that, um, you know, will continue to maintain the current economic and racial and gender structures in place. Right. And it's, obviously more than that. It's really hard to trace the money uh, because a lot of it is in limited liability corporations. Some of it's dark money. Uh, some of it's just the normal ways. Um, what does that mean, okay. and, huh? What does dark money mean? Oh, dark money. It means um, money that's not publicly disclosed coming from donors that are never publicly disclosed. So uh, for example, the Coke uh, Industries and, and Charles Coke, and he's now dead, but David Coke, uh, have networks that are entirely uh, organized around soliciting and deploying dark money in, in, in a variety of ways. Um, limited liability corporations, such as Arnold Ventures now, also have a way of, of being able to keep donors secret, to not uh, talk about the amounts, et cetera, et cetera. So between ordinary tax policy and the way it enables 
um, the way other government policies enable dark money and all of that kind of thing, it's really hard to calculate a total. You have to go into foundation fundings and foundations report out their funding in a million different ways. So we don't know. We know that Arnold Ventures alone has probably deployed at least $100 million. That doesn't take into account everyone else. So it's huge. All right, we're still, gonna come back to, uh -huh. still, still a small investment. Exactly, for the game. exactly. For sure, for the con, a small investment in the con to keep the con going. Um, so we're gonna come back to the philanthropy in a second, but um, this piece you were saying about, you know, using cost as an argument um, is part of the con. And I think um, the, the notion that we're spending too much money, public money incarcerating people, um, prison by any other name talks a lot about how those cost-based arguments haven't, again, re actually reduced incarceration or criminalization. They've simply shifted them to these new forms that you are talking about where costs are downloaded onto criminalized people in communities. So we're paying too much to incarcerate people. So we'll make people pay to incarcerate themselves in their home, even though as Kay was saying, the driver of the criminalization that's leading to the incarceration is poverty. So it's creating a vicious cycle. So tell us more about how you all um, walk that out in prison by any other name, Maya. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. I think one of the things that we see these so-called unlikely allies uniting around is consistently the fact that prisons and policing cost so much. So, and I don't think it should surprise us because, and this is one of the things that Kay and Nancy write in their book, is a big part of the bipartisan consensus is around neoliberalism. Like it's a neoliberal consensus. And so there's this mainstream instinctive understanding we shouldn't be spending taxpayer money. That's just, you know, spending taxpayer money is like automatically a bad thing. But when we have this budget motivation in play, which initially you might think, great, we're coming at this for different reasons, but we're in the same place, perfect. But this motivation, I think we have to ask, how is the money being saved? And what do we do with that saved money? And sometimes with these reforms, the answers are pretty horrifying. So we see this with electronic monitoring. Conservatives often love it because they say, oh, you don't have to pay for people's food like you do with prison. So we're saving money. You don't have to pay for people's housing if they're on electronic shackles. You don't have to provide health care like you do in prison. And granted, prison health care is not good. It's sometimes torturous. But this is just to say this is kind of how their priorities are unfurling. So cutting costs without then spending that money to support people. And meanwhile, then, of course, you see people in electronic shackles without reliable access to things like food and medical care and other basic needs, kind of from two directions actually, because they cannot afford it. And also in some cases really have trouble getting clearance to actually leave the house and get those things. I, I also wanna mention, we see some terrifying cost cutting measures that have happened with probation in recent years, we've got these increasingly private public partnerships, but also just private corporations. Um, and in these situations, we see people on probation themselves being required to pay fees to a private probation company. And sometimes people are nearly starving due to these fees especially since it's so hard to find a job when you're on probation. And sometimes the fees are just impossible to pay. And then the person is sent back to jail for non-payment sometimes. And I want to point out, you know, that the private companies are not like the driving force, like the root of the problem. They are parasites, as 
Ruth Wilson Gilmore and others have said, kind of making money off off of these things, um, but they're they're very present in this system. So these are some of the things we see playing out when people who are fixated on cost cutting take the reins, and when we use cost cutting as kind of like the sole point of consensus that we're gathering around. Vicki, did you have something you wanted to add onto that before I ask a follow-up question? I mean, if we think about this idea of shifting cost cutting, as, as Maya pointed out, you know, it's this idea that we're saving, you know, the government is somehow saving money by not incarcerating people or shifting, you know, this money, but it's not going back into the communities where people are from. It's not going into better schools, food access, or you know, housing access or any of these things. Instead, it goes into the giant pot of money that then gets spent on things like more policing, um, you know, more surveillance. I mean, as we have seen in 2020, when suddenly defund the police was a very, very loud demand and people were paying attention to the often onerous and boring city budgets, you know, and um, town budgets is that as we saw cuts happening in every other area of life, education, healthcare, roads, you know, everything else, what we saw was police budgets not getting that same haircut that every place else was. We see this again also with jails and prisons where they don't get that same haircut. So it's not really a cost savings. Again, it's like what Kay and Nancy call like the carceral con where it's like, we look like we're saving money, but we are not. And that money is not going into the communities that have been hardest hit by criminalization and incarceration. Exactly what I was gonna ask in terms of follow-up, which is that, um, yes, first of all, the, the cuts, often go from prison into policing. So Kay and um, Nancy talk a lot about um, the kind of Prop 47 issue in California where the Supreme Court was like, you all are over incarcerating, you're overcrowding, you have to release people from prison. And the savings from that decarceration of a, a small percentage of the California prison population didn't go into the services you're talking about. It went into more policing to criminalize people and then make them pay for their own criminalization. Um, I think the other thing that you're saying about the defund stuff, I, I feel like an attention to cost there is different than the kind of let's just um, let's just do it all more cheaply or download the cost onto mm -hmm. criminalized people. But there is a danger in the defund work that as you said, Vicki, if it's only about the budget, then we're just asking cops to kill us, rape us, maim us, and criminalize us more efficiently, right? So we're, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to decrease their budgets, but also their power, their reach, their uh, weapons, their scope, their, um, in their ability to do harm, not just the budgets with which they, they do it. So there is a danger in the defund uh, world of also focusing solely on costs. So um, that feels like a critical piece. I'm gonna pick this thread back up of this critical role of philanthropy um, in creating and refueling the reform industry that you were getting into for us, Kay. Um, it's not surprising given what philanthropy was created to do, right? The non, right. you know, the revolution will not be funded is, uh, explores that, the book that Insight put out in, I don't know, 2005 maybe, um, that talks about, and it was eye-opening for many people to be like, oh wait, this thing is set up to do this. It's set up to, sort of blunt the impact of, um, of more radical demands and to sort of manage them and to get us all sort of into these templates that you're talking about that will basically just bolster and expand the system. So can you tell us um, more about kind of why philanthropy is playing the role that it is and sometimes directly funding cops and, and um, prisons and so on in order to maintain the system? Right, well, uh, Again, years ago, uh, in talking with uh, foundation officials and people in certain large organizations that all wish to remain off the record, there's nothing like doing research uh, 
in, in this <laughs> to, to encounter many, many people who want to say a lot and want to say it all off the record. Uh, but they talked a lot about how in the um, philanthropy world, there had been efforts to bring parties together across big, big, big issue divides um, in order to create a, a kind of hail fellow well met kind of uh, forward together, arm in arm, hand in hand uh, kind of thing across partisan divides. And the first things they tried to do uh, with uh, philanthropy driven projects was to bring people together for immigration reform and then also climate change reform. Guess what happened? You know, those, the acrimony, they said, you know, it just became impossible to really create anything that was actually uh, bipartisan. They had some somewhat larger success, uh, although not universal, thanks to the role of, of teachers unions and the love of many people for actually good systems of public education. They tried it with education reform too. And that's still ongoing in a certain way. But with criminal justice reform, criminal legal system reform, they hit a bonanza. They, there were lots of players ready to come together to take the money to try to, um, and I'm not gonna say that everybody just wanted to take the money. There are some very good intentions with some funders, with some, um, organizations and foundations that sign on to this, but we shouldn't be looking at intentions. We need to be looking at impacts, larger scale impacts over time. The real argument is that billionaires and wealthy foundations shouldn't be the brokers of justice at all, but they are, and they are have been primary drivers in combination with certain uh, policy think tanks like the very right wing Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, you know, the Koch brothers signed, uh, signed on early on. It's not that just them, you know, Ford Foundation, uh, MacArthur Foundation, um, all kinds of groups, Pew Charitable Trust, you know. Um, are very much a part of this. And none of those foundations are, in fact, I will just venture to say, there's almost no foundation, certainly I know of no big one that has an unmixed uh, record. Uh, some of them have uh, funded some really good things and also funded some really questionable things. We always end up quoting Ruth Wilson Gilmore a lot. And in what I'm going to quote her saying, realize that the, the phrase social wage as used here, uh, I'm going to define as generally as public expenditures for the universal collective good. It can be social security and pensions, healthcare, education, housing, childcare, all of those good kinds of things good water infrastructure, good mass transit infrastructure, all of that kind of stuff. That's a social wage because it applies and helps everyone. Ruth Wilson Gilmore said recently that philanthropy is the private allocation of stolen wages. Think about that, the private allocation of stolen wages. And what she means by that is the wages were stolen the first time by accumulating such huge wealth by exploiting people and exploiting environments and natural resources. And the second form of theft comes through tax breaks and loopholes and policies that always favor the wealthy uh, over, over the common people. So philanthropy is the private allocation of stolen wages. Um, there, it is quite clear from looking at the agendas that these agendas do, as, as Maya was saying about neoliberalism, they, they literally 
sort of support without saying so, they never say so publicly, but they support an austerity agenda where uh, literally we see criminal justice reform substitute for real bold, robust work in the public sphere for civil rights and for structural and into structural racism and structural poverty to address structural violence. They're, they will use rhetoric that indicates that they're very sympathetic to that. But if you look at what's happening, it doesn't. So simply put, um, philanthropy or more accurately, charity is always conditional and it cannot and will not ever produce justice or structural well-being. And that's why it's important to take real change out of the hands of philanthropy and billionaires and very powerful and wealthy public and private interests and work toward radical redistribution of social, civic and economic resources. And, and, and we can talk more uh, about doing that, but literally you will find it's everything from Coke Industries to Arnold Ventures, to um, Ford Foundation, to MacArthur, to Open Society Foundations that are promoting some part of this. And you will find that it is particularly the right-wing funding sources, not exclusively, but particularly the right-wing funding resources that are, are really, um, I would say, tightening the noose of carceral control that, that that's been clear from, from the beginning. And they tend to Arnold Ventures, for example, um, doesn't consider itself right wing, but uh, it has played an undue role, uh, outsized role in setting up councils, helping to fund organizations. So has Coke Industries in naturalizing uh, risk assessment instruments and other kinds of data collection things. So it's, um, I'm gonna ask Nancy to weigh in just a little on, on this, this whole question of um, philanthropy driven mantra of evidence-based work, evidence-based yeah. solutions. Yeah. Um, you've said a lot, Kay, but, but let me just briefly add that um, the involvement of um, the nonprofit industrial complex, uh, maybe especially, um, um, you know, Pew Charitable Trust was in this very early on with, you know, reform in Louisiana, um, you know, certainly um, Arnold Ventures. Um, part of their role, I think, is to um, mm, create this veneer, um, you know, solidify the veneer of um, bipartisan or some, in some cases, nonpartisan. Um, and then certainly um, to further the idea that somehow this is quote unquote objective. And this is especially the case with you know, their role in developing um, um, templates for you know, evidence-based assessments in terms of who should be released on bail, um, evidence-based assessments in terms of guidance, you know, the release of prisoners, um, you know, and well, the, the, the data, of course, for all of this um, comes from data that's collected by the criminal legal system itself, right? It's going to come from policing data, um, court data, you know, so you, you have this illusion really of objectivity, of neutrality, um, that is very much rooted in bias. Part of the con. There's so much to unpack in there too. I think one, the, the piece that you were saying, um, Kay, about, you know, even the best foundations have a mixed record. Mm -hmm. And I think we saw that a lot in the kind of uprising last summer where on the one hand, people, foundations were funding folks working to divest from policing and invest in community safety. And at the same time, they were investing in organizations that were pushing the Justice and Policing Act that would have poured exactly the same amount of money, almost to the dollar, mm -hmm. 
back into police departments that folks on the ground fought tooth and nail to get out of police departments, right? So they're literally betting against some of the people that they're funding in trying to like, you know, play all angles. Sorry, the abolitionist cat is very um, exercised by this. Um, and, um, yes. The other thing that stood out, um, and I'm going to also want to come back to the evidence-based piece, Nancy. But the um, the other thing that that stands out is that you know we are talking about billionaires, and if you believe that policing is set up to protect property and not safety and community, why wouldn't they be about protecting a system that protects their wealth um, and you know manage rebellion against it by sort of you know, trying to trim it around the edges or make it look less disparate, as you were saying, Kay. So I appreciate both of your um, sort of really robust analysis and Kay, your willingness to give examples and name names, because I was going to ask you, I mean, what you what you described looked a little bit like the cover of your book, right? This like shady, murky, backroom deal thing. And, and I think people needed concrete examples. So I appreciate um, you laying that out. Was there something you wanted to add before I move on to the next thing, which is where we're going, I think? No, let's move on. Okay. Um, I do want to also um, uh, name this piece around evidence-based um, um, alternatives or, or reforms, Nancy, that you were lifting up, because I think one thing that philanthropy has done is promote some of these things that um, Vicky and um, Maya talk about in prison by any other name, some of these alternative programs, diversion programs as um, evidence-based, right? Um, and that they're there, but as Nancy is saying, all the evidence comes from the system to show that its way of doing things that continues to police and control and surveil people is successful and it is successful at policing, surveilling, and controlling people. So <laughs> philanthropists are also behind some of these so-called alternatives that just produce the same thing in new forms. One of them is law enforcement assisted diversion programs. Um, sometimes celebrity philanthropists get in the game like Jay-Z and Meek Mill, and they're behind electronic monitoring, and they're kind of falling prey to and playing into the con because they're believing that they're somehow helping folks by doing this, but in fact, um, expanding folks. So there's there's billionaires um, who are celebrities, there's billionaires who are less well-known, um, but all of them are playing into this carceral con and then using this notion that things are evidence-based uh, that Nancy was uh, putting up to sort of uh, cover that. So that's where we are. Um, before we get to kind of where we're going or as we pivot to where we're going, I think, um, in the campaigns to defund police or divest from policing, um, there's been this real push for alternatives, right? Like, okay, last summer, defund police. Okay, uh, we're behind that demand, but what's the alternative? There has to be an alternative. There has to be something that replaces police. And a lot of what people are proposing are a lot of things that you, Vicky and Maya describe in your book as prison or police by another name. Um, particularly in the context of treatment, right? Mental health crisis response that will give people treatment instead of, you know, putting them in jails or will give people drug treatment instead of um, putting them in prison. Can you say a little bit more um, about these sort of approaches and how they're part of this expanding of the system rather than they're part of the con, um, Vicki and Maya? Sure. Um, so we have to so in this wake of people talking about um, substituting one thing for another, we have to remember that not everything needs to be substituted. You don't need to have, you know, like, you know, we would have sent X number of thousands of people to jail or to prison or into a cage. And now we need to build something else to put them in. So it's a logic of what Miriam Kaba calls putting them somewhere else. You know, um, like they need to go somewhere as opposed to saying what structures and what supports can we build in our community and out on the streets, you know, so that people don't, you know, instead of shuffling people off to this somewhere else where they're out of sight, out of mind, it doesn't matter what happens to them. Um, and one of the things that we've seen um, in the past several years, as you know, we see more uh, 
we see more and more attention being paid to police killing folks who are in the middle of a mental health crisis or who are acting erratically, you know, mentally or mentally erratically, um, is this idea that you can somehow pair them with social workers or pair them with, uh, you know, mental health workers, and this will somehow reduce police violence. Um, and I think what it does is it gives this idea that, well, you can do that and it will somehow magically make the police less violent as opposed to saying, well, now we're just putting a nicer, you know, a nicer pairing to it. But in the heat of the moment, who gets to make a decision? The person with the gun and this idea that they exert total authority or the person who is saying like, hey, 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 wait, let me try to, you know, let me try to deescalate. Let me try to talk to this person. Um, and also what, what does that pairing look like if both of them come from this mentality and logic of, policing, you know, and you somehow need to contain and confine and subdue a person who is not acting in a way that society expects that person to act. Um, so I think that first we have to remember that what it does is it basically still puts power in the hands of police to say that they should be accompanied by somebody else instead of saying we should be figuring out other ways to intervene when somebody is acting in ways that we think might be harmful. Um, you know, if somebody is just standing on the corner and talking to themselves, does that need a police response? If somebody is standing on the corner and threatening people, you know, um, and talking to themselves, yes, you want some sort of intervention before it escalates, but does it need to be a police intervention? Does it need to be an armed person with a gun, regardless of whether they have a social worker or a mental health worker with them? And then as Maya and I talk about in our book, and I'll talk about the uh, mental health treatment aspect, and I'll let Maya talk about some of the other forms of treatment that are being proposed as alternatives, mandated treatment often replicates, you know, one model of coercive control, you know, engaging people with another form. So there are many similarities to prison, like losing your bodily autonomy, you're told when to get up, when to go to sleep. Um, when you are mandated to psychiatric confinement or put in forced mental health treatment, you are told you better take these medications. If not, somebody will come and pry open your mouth and you will take those medications. Um, if you are seen to be acting out, you will be put in a room that is very similar to solitary confinement. Um, for folks on this webinar, imagine being locked in your smallest bathroom I understand some of you have palatial spaces, you know, these days. Um, so you might not have a, you know, your bathrooms might be rather large, but imagine being locked in a very small bathroom, you know, for, you know, days on end with no way to get out, um, you know, and rather than being places to receive support and help, oftentimes these places become additional punishment instead. Um, and they don't address, and they often fail to address root causes of you know, what is happening and it pathologizes the individual and doesn't look at like the environmental conditions and structural conditions that might also have led to this point. Totally agree on all of that. I just wanted to um, say that it's not just about necessarily um, having somewhere else to put somebody but also having someone else to call it feels like was also a big part of this uh, that I have to be able to call someone, that there's no responsibility I have to the person standing on the corner to just go up and be like, are you okay? Do you need some water? Do you, are you okay with where you're staying? Is everything okay? And then also there isn't a questioning of the notion that there's certain norms of behavior that we all have to stay in and anything less than, more than like outside those norms is somehow threatening, right? And I think there's, I often hear people talk about, okay, we need not just to have a mental health crisis response, but we need behavioral health interventions. That means we're trying to make you conform to some norm as opposed to just the diversity of human experience and experiences of reality and so on. So it feels like these, these, um, so these notions of we have to have an alternative or someone else to call or somewhere else to put people conceal some more deeper kind of senses of, of needing some kind of response and and pull into our own carcerality right that we want 
people to fall into some kind of line so they or we our order is disturbed in some way and uh and that's what's driving some of these alternatives so i think the reason i wanted to get there is because i think maya there's uh, this question this presumption that drug use is inherently problematic right and therefore you know we want to we need a, a response to drug use as opposed to not so yeah absolutely i right i i think it's really important that you lifted all of that up because i think there's so much deep-seated ableism in this just rush to replace police with kind of just okay we need an exact substitution any instance in which you would call the police because someone is talking to themselves in your driveway or because there happens to be someone who appears not to have a house in your library, in your public library. Like, oh, you have to, or, you know, someone, like, there's all of these situations in which our society is so built on isolation and also ableism that you just, like, would not approach a person or let a person just do their thing. So I think that's really important. And yeah, I, I think drug use, definitely falls into this category. And um, one thing that has really been rising to the surface lately is these, these problem solving courts, which are just one of the go-to solutions that lawmakers and mainstream groups have been lifting up in the wake of the uprisings, but also before with some of these waves of reform. So these are sometimes known as treatment courts, drug courts, mental health courts, domestic violence courts, but they're still courts. They're still doling out orders and sentences. And they're very popular. This is another place that Biden is really excited to voice his opinion whenever someone asks him what should happen to people convicted of drug possession, he says mandatory rehab. Um, which means forcing people into buildings known as rehab that they cannot get out of. So he, he's a big proponent of that. And although some progressives are critical of drug courts, the bipartisan consensus is definitely overwhelmingly in favor of them. Um, the idea that people arrested for drug possession should go to mandatory rehabilitation does not hold up in any way, like even by the system's own standards. People, there's a very bad graduation rate from these types of programs. People are not actually staying abstinent from drugs. Um, and, but I think more importantly, it doesn't hold up when you actually listen to people who've experienced certain treatment programs. So in our book, we share the story of a person who was put in a dormitory in a treatment center called that was known among the residents there as the House of Pain. And she wanted to leave the facility. And as punishment, she was forced to sit on a chair in the middle of the hallway for days on end, only allowed to leave for meals and to sleep and thinking about, okay, but this is a treatment center. This is a place of care. You know, this is our, this is our alternative, our magical alternative that we always put forth. I think we really have to question that. Um, a lot of formerly incarcerated people who end up in drug court programs say that they look a lot like prison. The same locked doors, strip searches before visits, same very limited family visiting hours, often the same separation from your children, which is, which is this very grave punishment. And a lot of them have a similar focus on punishment in response to breaking rules, although not all of them do. And so, and I think within all of this, we also have to come back to the brick and mortar prisons and recognize that within these problem solving courts, within this whole range of treatment and care, so-called opportunities, the punishment 
for relapsing or for breaking the rules of whatever program you're in or veering outside the norms, which are intense abstinence, right? Abstinence from alcohol, abstinence from drugs. Very often you're not supposed to have any romantic or sexual contact with other people in the program. So it's just like the norm is intense abstinence. And if you veer away from that, in a lot of these programs, you're actually risking going to jail, going to a brick and mortar jail. So, so this is what these programs look like in practice. And I think that when we hear these, these buzzwords, help, care, treatment, the minute you slap something with a health-related label, it becomes kind of acceptable as an alternative as opposed to incarceration. And I think we always have to ask, okay, what's happening in these programs? Is policing happening? Is surveillance happening? Is punishment ha happening? What are the types of control that are being enacted? Um, and, and go from there. And I think that we also have to ask, like, what are the ways that this is entrenching and expanding the system? Because as I said earlier, many of the people who are in these programs might not have gone to prison or jail. They might not have been on monitoring. They might have actually had their charges dropped or been released or had some much less restrictive situation to, to contend with. Until someone decided they needed help, right? Exactly. Um, so rich, such a, and we're coming to your questions. We have some rich questions too, um, but I want to um, really sort of close out the panel part on sort of the future, where we're going. And Nancy, you're right next door to a place that next, a week from today, we'll be voting on a ballot initiative uh, in Minneapolis, where since, you know, um, when folks started talking about dismantling the Minneapolis Police Department, it became clear that there's this thing in the charter that requires the city to keep a police department of a certain size. And so folks are trying to get rid of this provision that basically you know, holds the city hostage to a police department of a certain size um, and replace it with um, you know, a, community, a department of community safety that's rooted in public health approaches. And um, similarly at the federal level, Representative Cory Bush is trying to pass the People's Response Act, which would create a federal department focused on promoting, you know, quote unquote, non-carceral public safety strategies. So are these, you know, pathways to abolition? Are there, is there promising approaches there? Are there some pitfalls based on uh, what's in the carceral con and prison by any other name? What, what are your thoughts on that? You know, if I could go ahead, because I actually am in Minneapolis. I I, I teach right next door in St. Paul, but I'm in Minneapolis right now. And, uh, you know, yes, we'll vote um, yes on two. Um, the promise, um, certainly um, the uprisings, uh, you know, especially around the murder of George Floyd, but, you know, Ferguson, Eric Garner, um, um, you know, beginning even with Trayvon, um, have led more and more people to question the criminal legal system and its efficacy and certainly um, whether it had anything to do with justice at all. Um, you know, and as you certainly know, the conversation about abolition um, is a broader one now. It's available to more people. It's, um, it's a widespread conversation and consideration now that certainly it wasn't even two years ago. So that's the promise, um, the pitfalls. Um, you know, I think Maya um, raised a lot of them. I mean, certainly I hope to pass this and I hope this sort of expectation that there must be a police department with X number of officers in the city of Minneapolis, I hope that is gone. Um, but I do get nervous about, um, you know, the, the, the commitment to replace that with a public health approach. Um, you know, sometimes people call Minnesota the land of 10,000 treatment centers. Um, of course, Hazelden and the Hazelden model 
um, was developed here. And so I think we need to be cautious if two passes, um, you know, that we don't um, replace one, you know, carceral system with a kinder, gentler version of that. Um, other pitfalls, there's been a lot of backlash, um, boatload of dark money, um, very um, litigious and acrimonious um, campaigns about this. I get like literally five pieces of campaign literature to my house every day um, with lies about, you know, what will happen if we vote yes on two. Um, so it's brought out the, um, mm, the worst of Minneapolis politically. Um, other cautionary tale, and I don't have, you know, we talk about it in carceral cons, certainly there's been others discussion of it too, but a lot of times people tout Camden, New Jersey, um, as some great example of, oh, we dismantled the police department in Camden. New Jersey, well, um, did Camden really? Or um, um, did they just create a different, more problematic model, uh, which then continued to disproportionately target, you know, the quote unquote usual suspects? Thank you. I was just dropping something on Camden in the chat. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, and so, yeah, some of us, including you, Kay, because um, that's part of how we met, have spent some time, Kay and I were co-authors with um, another brilliant human, Joey Mogul, of this book, Queer Injustice, The Criminalization of LGBT People in the United States. So we've known each other a long time and, and we've tried to reduce the harms of the criminal punishment system, you know, through what we might call non-reformist reform, radical reform, transformative reform, um, efforts to kind of chip away at the system on the path to abolition. And, and sometimes we've fallen into some pitfalls that, you know, we've fallen for the carceral con sometimes. Maybe I won't speak for you. I know I've fallen for the carceral con sometimes. I have too. Um, and, yeah. um, and so what can we do? What, what are, how can, what are some guideposts for how to fall for it less as we try and chip away at the systems uh, of violence and harm that you were talking about? Well, I can start by just saying one thing that, that is so clear to me, and that's that we can get caught in this sort of centrifuge in whirlpools and eddies of, of reform logic. And with reforms, we start with the prisons and policing, and that's exactly where we end up. They're just stronger, they're redesigned, they're cosmetically uh, changed, there's a makeover, there's something like this. I may continue to work for non-reformist reforms that put no, uh, that help decarcerate people, completely decarcerate them without adding more resources, more staff, new facilities um, in, into the, the criminal and legal system. But more and more, I become convinced of the importance of two things. One is doing community organizing in a way that uh, in our local communities that begins to cross constituencies and movements for social and racial and gender and economic and environmental justice. All of these movements, reproductive justice, all of these movements have a huge stake in decarcerating society in, in a huge way, but we're not at a place where there's an independent recognition of that yet. So I think it's important to do that. We're all getting hammered by a couple of things, by the increased criminalization of protest, by the increased, um, criminalization of, of practically everything and by growing social, economic and environmental precarity. The divides, the wealth divides, the racial divides are deepening in this country. They are not getting any better. And that's why I think it's so incredibly essential 
to really work strategically toward radical redistribution of social, civic, and economic resources um, to change fiscal and economic priorities. That always means doing a lot of education like we're doing tonight, like everyone here and so many of our friends and colleagues have been doing for literally decades. Um, we keep doing that. And then we start to build strategically toward a different structural set of goals. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm in the Q and A um, and ready to um, take us through those and answering was answering a question about how you define abolition by pointing someone to critical resistance. So um, the, one of the questions in the Q and A comes to this point that you just made about, you know, can we address the problems of the carceral system without addressing the larger problems in our society? So many folks are, for lack of better words, delusional about what even is described in media as crime and what safety means, et cetera. So um, it sounds like what I was hearing you say, Kay, and I'm curious um, about you know, what other panelists might have to say about how we might go about addressing uh, the issues that we're talking about in a more structural way while also trying to reduce the harms of the system as it currently exists. I think that uh, if I'm reading the question correctly, um, is that, you know, like the, the person is asking, like, we, you can't have abolition in a vacuum, right? Like, you can't say get rid of all the jails and prisons, and everybody will just behave wonderfully towards one another. I mean, that is not the world we live in. But we, what we do have to separate out is this notion of crime, right? Like, because crime is, you know, like this, this I, you know, like, is something that is legislated and certain people are targeted as perpetrators of crime and other people who do massive amounts of harm to people are not thought of as perpetrators of crime or harm doers or anything else. So like you can have somebody who, you know, sinks the pension of like of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who now will, you know, be poor, jobless, homeless, you know, uh, for their own benefit and that is not considered a crime that was i don't know a bad stock trade you have you know the sackler family that you know perpetuated um you know this huge opioid crisis and that is not considered a crime but the person who is selling oxycontin you know on the street is you know considered a criminal and you know is punished so i think first off this idea that we need to separate this idea of crime from harm and violence you know and and so First up, when we do that, we can say like, well, you know, like is, you know, do we need police for everything? Do we need police for everything or anything? And then I think also to this question of, you know, um, policing and imprisonment for people on this webinar, ask yourselves, look back at your week and ask yourselves how often you did not commit harm or violence because you feared going to being arrested and then going to jail or prison. You know, did you not punch the person in the grocery store who annoyed you because you feared the police? You know, did you not like get out of your car and go beat somebody up, you know, because they took your parking spot because you feared going to jail or to prison or did you just not do it? Because I think for the most part, we have to remember that um, police come after something has happened and the majority of people do not uh, deter, you know, do not, uh, deter from crime or punishment or violence because they are afraid of being arrested and imprisoned. And then, yes, we need these larger structural supports, which policing and prisons take so much out of. I mean, your earlier question about um, funding and, you know, like where that goes to and this idea that if we, you know, take money out of the prison system or we reduce the cost of imprisonment, will that go to the community? And we keep seeing again and again that it does not. So I think when these demands to defund the police have not been defund the police and have money go nowhere, it's defund the police and invest in communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and just sort of picking up on that as a question saying that, you know, yes, we know that so-called violent crimes and we have some uh, resources in the chat to kind of debunk that, including Vicky's book, Prisons Make Us Safer and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration. But even knowing that 
violent and crimes are defined in particular ways and are very low percentages of what cops actually get calls about. Um, sometimes you do punch someone about their parking spot, taking your parking spot. Um, so uh, folks are curious about what what the plan is when those kinds of things happen under abolition. Thoughts on this panel that don't involve replicating the carceral con or the prison by another name? Well, I don't have a single answer for that and I don't think anybody does, but some enormous and really visionary and highly practical work is going on around the country um, some of it's reported at um, interrupting the interrupting uh, criminalization website that's dropped in the uh, chat. You can get that resource there. There, um, what is the website that deals with a million? What is it? I just put I just put it in the chat. Millionexperiments.com. Yeah, okay. A millionexperiments.com. There is transformharm.org a website um, that I will drop in. And I there's an amazing group called Creative Interventions that's working um, on community violence, interpersonal violence, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with a lot of different um, strategies and, and approaches uh, to do that. So I'm, perhaps other panelists here have more specific, um, answers, but what I'm struck by is the enormous creativity of work that's going on on the ground to really pioneer some, that's a terrible word, I take back the word pioneer, they're working to put forward uh, really new models of, um, of how we negotiate our relationships so that we're not harming each other. You know, let me let me echo that and uh, um, really echo what um, you know what, what's been, I think, a sub theme throughout all of this um, conversation is about the need for um, community, um, uh, need for reliance on well, what sociologists would call informal social control, right? Some sort of understanding um, in community. Um, about how to negotiate norms and relationships and 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 interaction. Um, you know, I'll I'll second all the resources list, listed here. Um, second again to the idea that, well, let me quote Ruth Wilson Gilmore again, who talks about abolition not just as an absence, um, but a, but a presence, right? So it's not just about we're dismantling the prison industrial complex, which yes, indeed we are. Um, but but then what um, are we building in terms of community? How could some of those millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of resources, um, you know, invested now in policing and punishment and surveillance be put back into community support in housing and healthcare and education, um, you know, that, that in many ways um, get at the root of so much of what we end up calling, right, crime. Um, so, you know, not an easy, simple answer. Um, you know, we make the road by walking, you know, and, and I'm an increasingly heartened um, that that there's so many people, you know, willing to consider that pathway. Grateful Thank for that. Definitely. And I just want to acknowledge that you and Kay have been on that path long before it was cool, <laughs> long before <laughs> everybody was talking about it. You were grinding. Uh, I think, um, Nancy, you were maybe involved in this, this situation, Abolition Now, the CR10 anthology? I, I wasn't directly involved, but I was certainly aware of it and, um, you know, supportive of, um, you know, of, the, of that work from the beginning. Yeah. Right. And so this came out in, you know, I don't know, 2010 something. Anyway, so there's, you know, there's a lot of work that these folks have been doing for a long time. I know Vicki and Maya similarly have been abolitionists long before 
it was cool. Apparently this cat was abolitionist long before it was cool. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so I just want to just honor the, the many years of work that are reflected in these books and in this conversation and um, in this analysis and really encourage folks to read these books. Um, I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to more of these questions, but um, one around cash bail, um, Nancy referred to it um, briefly, this question of pretrial assessments and, and risk assessments and, and algorithms, many of which are advanced by this group that Kay uh, referred to, Arnold Ventures and others. Um, so I just dropped um, a link in the Q&A to answer that question, but mostly you should buy Carceral Khan to get the answer to that question. Um, and some of these other questions, you know, how does a patsy step out of the con and stop being a willing mark? Um, and how do we lead here from the gendered, abled, or disabled or ableized, racialized margin? Um, again, there's a lot of sort of ideas in both of these books and in the work that these folks do. So please check it out. Um, and let me, and then in terms of the social work student, there's um, abolitionist social work hashtag on Twitter. Um, and there's a number of social workers who are organizing from a more abolitionist perspective to stop perpetuating prison by another name. So check them out on the internet. I hope that covers at least uh, superficially most of the questions. And I just wanna close here by thanking our incredible authors and panelists. So pick up uh, Carceral Con by Nancy Heitzig and Kay Whitlock, amazing book. Pick up the newly out in paperback copy of Prison by Another Name by Vicki Law and Maya Shenoir. Pick up also that Truth Out anthology. It's around here somewhere. Oh, maybe it's like my book is on top of it um, <laughs> called um, Which Side Are You On? Um, or Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? That's what it's called. Yes, thank you, Vicki. Um, and also get Vicki's other book, Prisons Make Us Safer and 20 Other Myths About Mass Incarceration. Do get Abolition Now by the Critical Resistance Collective. Also drop the Critical Resistance um, uh, uh, website in the um, chat because there's so many um, resources there. Thank you interpreters uh, for being here tonight. Uh, thank you to our captioner and thank you to New Press and University of North Carolina Press for bringing uh, this brilliance to you all tonight. So wishing you all a safe and um, well evening and um, onwards to fighting the carceral con and making sure we don't end up with prison by any other name. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks all. Thanks so much. And thank you, Andrea. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Oh. In my Andrea, honor you've pleasure. been you've been around for I a have. long time as well. And I have. Uh, <laughs> you have really been through some of the struggles. You know, so one of these true. days we're all gonna listen to you tell stories around a very <laughs> strange campfire. <laughs> or in your very big house. I would rather us yeah. just be in abolitionist futures and enjoying uh, the stories of remember that time when there was police and we did a whole panel about this whole conversation. <laughs> yeah. Remember when yeah. there was I that. I talk about that all the time when <laughs> like when we were writing our book and we would have to push back our deadline and we would say well like hopefully the book will be out of date and won't have to be released because mm -hmm. abolition will have come to pass and then we can sit on the beach. Exactly. So everybody should buy but, these books before they're obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was amazing work. Appreciate it, everyone. Thanks, everyone. I think Jay's about to kick us off. Have a great night. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.